let us now start looking at a very simple yet insightful uh, domain of mechanism design with transfers and that domain is the domain of single indivisible object allocation. We have already seen one example, uh, one mechanism which is truthful in this domain namely the second price auction but uh, here we will not only try to characterize that uh, which other mechanisms are also truthful in, in the context of single indivisible object allocation, we will also try to maximize the revenue earned for the auctioneer while selling the single indivisible object. Um, now the, uh, the reason is that we get a very uh, rich set of elegant results in this uh, simple setting and we, we can actually go beyond the limits of uh, deterministic, uh, deterministic mechanisms and we'll look at some randomized mechanisms as well. So uh, in this domain, the setup is the following. So we have the type set for each agents. We'll uh, modify the notation slightly so that it is, it, is, it is falling in line with the standard definitions of single indivisible object. So the Ti, which is the equivalent of a capital theta i, uh, as we have defined elsewhere, this uh, is a subset of real line. So now the type set is, uh, is a subset of real line which denotes that if you pick a specific type of an, uh, of an agent i, uh, this denotes the value that this agent gets when she wins the object. So it's as simple as that. And now uh, in this context, the allocation a uh, is a vector uh, of length n that represents the probability of winning this object by the respective agent. This is the first time that we have uh, spoken about the probability of winning a uh, winning an object or probabilistically uh, uh, deciding certain allocation. So far, we have discussed only deterministic allocations. But because of the simplicity of this domain, we can actually give certain results, which is also probabilistic in nature. So, which is also randomized mechanisms. So, this kind of mechanisms where the final outcome or the allocation are uh, probabilistic. Uh, yeah, those kind of mechanisms we are going to call as randomized mechanisms. We have not discussed this in the context of, uh, of the, the previous cases like uh, uh, the gibbers weight setting or in the context of um, single picked preferences uh, or task allocation because it's much harder to, to get a kind of a characterization result. But because of the simplicity of this domain, we can actually uh, take a look at that and we'll show that there are certain good results. So therefore, the set of allocations in this case is no longer in the set A, uh, the set of allocations, uh, the, the, the set of pure allocations, rather it's a probabilistic allocation. So uh, the vector, so this uh, delta of A is nothing but a simplex where um, uh, each of these elements in this set is a, uh, is a vector of uh, uh, numbers between 0 and 1 and they uh, all add up to 1. So this is nothing but a probability. Uh, probability uh, distribution over this n agents. Uh, the the object is going to get allocated probabilistically among one of these agents and in this case we are uh, assuming that the object is definitely going to get allocated. So there is nothing like uh, the object is not allocated. Now what is an allocation rule in this case? As before uh, the, the Cartesian product of all the typesets uh, the allocation function actually maps it to the set of allocations, now the set of allocation is this simplex over this set A. Alright, so now we have this uh, valuation function which is defined on that uh, kind of an allocation which could be a randomized allocation and its own type. But now uh, this valuation is just the, uh, the expected, uh, expected value uh, for that agent for that object. So AI is the probability with which this agent wins, uh, agent I wins that object and if it wins, it gets a, a value of Ti. So this product is giving is giving it the expected valuation. So similarly, uh, when we are talking about f of, uh, f of t, so if we look at the function f and apply, um, uh, so uh, use uh, the, the type report of all the agents as its argument, then we get a vector uh, whose ith component here is nothing but the probability of winning the object for that agent i. Now let us uh, try to familiarize ourselves with this notation when we are looking at uh, one of the much discussed example of uh, second price auction, the Vickery auction. 
So the type here in that case where where VIs for all these agents, and let us define uh, when we are looking at agent I, what is the maximum value of all the other agents except agent I? So that is being defined as t minus i of two. So uh, the two stands for the second bit. Uh, this uh, two will be the second highest bit when i is the highest bit. Now. Uh, agent I uh, is going to win uh, if its valuation is larger than the, the second highest bit. So if this a agent has the highest value, so the among all the other agents, uh, the, their maximum value, the, the a a agent I's value VI is even larger than that, then that is the maximum among the, uh, the whole population uh, of bidders. So then uh, this, will be a, this will be considered as the winner and it will uh, lose if the the valuation is less than that and we can also say um, we can define a tie breaking rule uh, when there is an equality now the uh, the payment so we know that under second price auction uh, the uh, the winner pays the second highest bid so if agent i becomes the winner then it pays t minus i for all the other cases where the payment uh, where uh, vi is not not the highest bidder uh, its value is going to be zero anyway so we can write the utility of this player i uh, in the following way if vi is less than or equal to t, t minus i2 uh, it, it is going to get a utility of zero if it is larger than t minus i2 uh, the difference is going to be the the net utility so we can plot uh, this uh, this quantities and we can see that the utility has a very uh, interesting shape now on the x-axis we have plot the, plotted the uh, valuation of this agent and on the y-axis the utility. Up to this point of t minus i2 uh, the value, the utility of this agent becomes, uh, remains zero and after that it uh, increases um, uh, proportionally with vi and uh, because this is just vi so this uh, the slope of this curve will be 45 degrees. Now the other thing that we can observe, so if we uh, do another plot for the allocation of uh, uh, of this agent, we see that up to uh, t minus i2, uh, this allocation is going to be zero, and whenever uh, the uh, the valuation is uh, larger than that, then uh, the allocation is going to be exactly equal to one. So we leave this point of the exact equality open at this moment because in that case when they are equal that means that there are at least some other agent who also has the same valuation as, as this agent. So in that case one can randomly pick any of these agents as, uh, as winners and therefore any of these numbers, uh, numbers could be uh, could be a valid allocation for this agent. So we can make a few observations from these uh, uh, two curves. The first thing is that this utility curve is convex. So if you look at this curve, um, this is a convex curve. And uh, the derivative is uh, zero if, uh, if vi is less than or equal to this, and uh, one if uh, the, uh, the valuation is larger than this threshold point, and it is not differentiable at this, uh, at this threshold point. So at this point uh, t minus i2 it is non-differentiable but whenever this uh, uh, function is differentiable it actually coincides with the allocation we can also see that so uh, these are the two two points in fact uh, a lot of our understanding of the single object allocation will depend on the properties of convex functions and therefore, we, uh, in, the, in the rest of this module, we are going to spend some time to discuss some of these uh, known results from convex analysis. For, for most of these uh, results, we will not provide a proof because they are clearly out of scope of this course. Uh, if you are interested in looking at the proofs, you can take a look at uh, some standard text like Rockefeller. But uh, wherever necessary, we will provide some sort of a uh, intuition of why this this uh, sort of a result is uh, actually true. Uh, the first fact from convex analysis is that uh, convex functions are continuous in the interior of its domain. So, which means that this kind of a convex function. So, whenever you are talking about uh, functions which are convex, you cannot have jumps within a domain of this function. So, what can happen is if a, if a function 
uh, has a let's say a domain from here to here uh, that uh, cannot be so that can never be any function which has a jump inside this because then you can actually have uh, some some sort of a chord joining these two points um, which is below the curve at some point so this is uh, whenever you have jumps you uh, you are certain that uh, that is not going to be a convex function inside its domain but this uh, property does not hold at the end so at the last point there could be some jump so you, you can have functions which goes all the way till this point and at the final point there is a certain jump so that is clearly uh, clearly convex um, so the for convex functions uh, the, it is known that uh, the they are going to be continuous in the interior of its domain so the second fact of convex functions is that they are differentiable almost everywhere now what is this term almost everywhere mean it means that the points where the function is not differentiable they form a countable set um, so we can see the example before that exactly at one point uh, or maybe there are uh, multiple other points where you can actually have it but you cannot create an interval of points for instance uh, where it is uh, non-differentiable so um, to be more uh, precise uh, this uh, set of uh, uh, the set of non-differentiable points uh, of, a, of a convex function forms a set uh, of measure zero so it's something like this point if you are looking at the, the whole set they are almost vanishing so if you are looking at only finite or countable number of points in an interval which has uncountably many points those finite or countable points has measure zero that is how uh, more uh, formally this is said but let us not worry about those those things it is uh, it is saying that uh, uh, except for a few points or a countable number of points the function is going to be differentiable everywhere now i i'm sure that uh, this uh, this uh, definition of the convex function is known to all of you so whenever we are defining a function uh, a convex function uh, then uh, for every point x and i in its domain so this is the domain of this uh, convex function and for uh, uh, for any lambda which is living in this uh, interval 0 comma 1 this is true so that means that whenever we are looking at uh, a convex combination of any two points so let's say uh, we have a function like this uh, and this is our uh, x-axis and we have two points let's say x and y and we are looking at the corresponding values of this function at these points so gx and gy and if we join a chord uh, between them so therefore lambda times uh, gx plus 1 minus lambda times gy is some point like this and that point will always be above the the, uh, the value of that function at that point so this is let's say this is the point lambda x plus 1 minus lambda of y and the g value at that point is going to be lying below that uh, that chord so the chord connecting any two points will always be above the curve that is the meaning of a uh, convex function now uh, if a, uh, if that function is differentiable uh, at a point inside this domain then we denote its derivative by g prime of x this is uh, quite standard but um, uh, we are going to define something which extends this idea of gradient or the derivative and that is uh, known that, that uh, extension is known as the subgradient of this function so how is subgradient defined it is defined formally in this way but uh, before going into the formal definition let's look at what is actually uh, what is this saying so let's look at a very specific point let's say x and we are going to a different uh, point y uh, z in this uh, in its domain and what we are doing is we are first looking at the value of that function at that point and then um, taking the distance so uh, so suppose i have a i have a point like uh, x somewhere and I, i'm trying to find out what is the value of this function uh, at at a different point let's say z and uh, I uh, do a kind of a uh, multiply this with uh, this difference of z minus x with a uh, with a constant quantity x star, and then add that on top of 
on top of this g of x so g of x is nothing but this point here and then we are taking a slope so the slope of this uh, uh, this line is nothing but x star and we are going to this point here so that quantity so this point is nothing but g of x plus x star times z minus x and that point should always be below the, the actual value of that uh, actual value of the function at that point if that happens then we are going to call this x star to be a subgradient of g at that point x and of course this uh, this i have only shown the positive direction uh, this should hold for all z so it, it should also hold for the other direction also uh, so in some sense you are essentially putting a line you are finding the slope of the line in such a way that the entire curve, entire convex curve is lying above it and that, that is the point which also touches that gx. So fair enough. So what is, uh, what is the, the property that it is giving us? So uh, we can actually um, uh, say that now we have, um, even though we cannot define a gradient at the point where it is not differentiable, so for instance the point where uh, this point was not differentiable in our previous example uh, so in this convex uh, uh, in this convex function but we can definitely define something like a subgradient and uh, naturally the subgradient need not be unique so in particular it is non unique in those points where it is not differentiable I, one can have a, a bunch of uh, uh, subgradients so uh, similar to so this is one extra which is a subgradient because it keeps the entire curve above it but you can also think of another subgradient which is also keeping the curve above it so there could be actually many subgradients uh, which are possible the uh, one observation that we would like to make the points where it is actually differentiable so let's say a point like this so this uh, red colored x uh, this point can you actually find multiple subgradients the answer is no because uh, if you if you for instance try to find some subgradient which is not exactly equal to its gradient here um, then you might end up having some points uh, which are actually above that uh, the value of that uh, uh, point so essentially this inequality will get violated uh, if we uh, pick some other kind of a subgradient some other line so one empirical observation that we, we can make here is that um, uh, whenever there is a point which is differentiable uh, of this uh, so if the convex function is differentiable at a certain point then the subgradient actually equals the the gradient and in that case the subgradient is going to be unique so that is something that we will we'll, uh, uh, state formally so these are the some uh, standard results uh, so you can refer to that standard text on convex analysis any standard text on convex analysis the first result is that uh, so suppose we have a, a convex function g and x is in the interior of i and g is uh, differentiable at x then g prime x is the unique subgradient of g so we have already told the intuition so this is the formal statement and it is not very difficult to show even formally all that you need to do is to uh, reuse this uh, uh, this inequality for uh, for the points which are above x so let's say x plus epsilon and also uh, uh, points below uh, below x x minus epsilon prime let's say and then use the definition the, the fundamental definition of uh, um, uh, derivatives and one can show that uh, this x star will be sandwiched between the uh, the left derivative and the right derivative and the points where uh, it is actually differentiable this left and right derivatives are same so therefore uh, this x star must be equal to that derivative so that is the that is the proof of this lemma so for lemma 2 um, uh, again we have a convex function and we uh, one can say that uh, this uh, function always has a subgradient uh, at all points in i so including the uh, the h points so uh, the earlier result was only for interior points uh, but uh, this this result is true the uh, subgradient uh, exists for all points uh, in i uh, the the next fact that we will be using uh, 
it says that if you collect together all the points where g is differentiable and denote it with i prime then and then the points where it is non differentiable that has a uh, uh, that is a set of measure zero and in addition the set of subgradients at a point forms a convex set so let's say we look at a look at a bunch of points um, so there will be some points where, where the function is differentiable we have already seen that uh, those points essentially so those kind of points are almost everywhere so uh, the function is differentiable almost everywhere uh, so and in those points the uh, derivative exactly is equal to the uh, uh, to the subgradient the points where it is not differentiable which is of a uh, which is uh, which is a set of measure zero in those points uh, the subgradient might be many but they actually form a convex set so uh, it, it is something like an interval uh, within which all the subgradients live so you can think of the the previous example here so uh, the subgradients will start from this point so which is a negative gradient to this point which is a positive gradient so all this point so you can think of this as the the uh, uh, the left derivative at this point at this point uh, green x and this uh, slope is nothing but the right gradient and all the points between this left gradient to right gradient in that interval all those points are subgradients of this uh, function at that point so that is exactly what is uh, we are going to state as fact 4 so if you look at the uh, the right gradient and uh, the, uh, the left gradient of, uh, of uh, this function g at that point then the set of subgradients at x which are non differentiable lives within this interval from g minus uh, prime x to g uh, plus prime x so uh, we will use a shorthand notation to denote the set of all subgradients at g uh, of g at a certain point by this del g of x uh, lemma 1 by lemma 1 we already know that the, uh, the points where it is differentiable so these are the uh, set this is the set where the uh, function is differentiable it is a singleton for all the other points it is non empty so the next lemma that uh, will be uh, that will be very much useful for us is uh, that of a, some sort of a monotonicity so we know that if it was a convex function and it was differentiable everywhere then we know that the derivative is monotonically increasing right i mean this is this is coming from the the fundamental property of convex function we can extend that idea to subgradients and we can also say that the subgradients um, uh, when when you are defining a function uh, by so there are points which are where it is differentiable there you uh, know that uh, the the subgradient is unique for the points where it is non differentiable you just arbitrarily pick one of those subgradients and define a function uh, in that way so that is how we are going to define this function phi so phi of z is uh, is an element of this delta g in gz as we have defined uh, for the points so for for all the points in i so for all the points in i prime we already know that uh, this is going to be this set is going to be singleton for all the points i minus i prime where right, it is non differentiable we just pick one point from that set and define the function in that way even in that uh, situation we know uh, so this lemma is uh, saying that uh, if you have uh, so if you uh, have x greater than y then the the corresponding function phi will also be non decreasing so it's a monotonicity condition on on those uh, subgradient function and you you can actually visualize this so here all these points on the uh, on the left hand side uh, they were having the uh, the subgradient to be negative so let's say all this minus of 1 and suppose this is this uh, gradient is plus 1 so uh, as we move from from this direction to this direction we see that uh, the the subgradient this phi function starts with minus 1 let's say it starts uh, so this uh, this is the phi function and it starts with minus 1 initially and at this point you can arbitrarily pick any point so it might be any number between minus 1 and 1 and then you have this uh, the the rest of the points uh, so this change over happens at this point uh, this this x so 
uh, and uh, and then onwards you, you can see that this function increases the function is always non decreasing that is the conclusion uh, from a convex function and the last result that we are going to state here is an integral formula involving the subgradients so we can actually find um, for any pair of points x and y that is living in this uh, domain of this uh, convex function uh, through this integral formula so uh, we can find the uh, value of this uh, convex function at point x starting from uh, point y uh, looking at the value of uh, uh, the function at point y and then integrating from that point to this new point from uh, y to x uh, using this um, and this subgradient. So, uh, what it is actually saying, this is something like uh, similar to the, uh, the the derivative formula. So, what is subgradient? It is the gradient, uh, except for a few points where it is not not differentiable. But we already know that those points are kind of countable and has measure zero. So, this integral will just uh, chop off. So, of course, this requires. Uh, this needs to be proved rigorously, but the point is that those points are uh, are just one point. Um, I mean, uh, they they have measure zero, so we cannot really uh, integrate the integral uh, over those points will be zero, and uh, uh, for the rest of the points we are just looking at the derivatives, and therefore the uh, when we want to find this function g of x. Starting from uh, g of y, we can just use this integral formula and get the get the value. So that this particular lemma will be very much useful when we try to characterize the payment of uh, of the single object auction mechanism uh, in our next modules.